First of all, you should understand this was not a war, technically, because war was never declared. But at first, let's give you some background perspective with a few statistics which we've already uh, seen published, but it's worth going through them again. This is the longest amphibious operation, 8,000 miles in history, the largest air-sea battle since World War II, over 1,000 died, 2,000 wounded, 23 ships either lost or damaged, 91 aircraft, 23 helicopters, all destroyed in a matter of weeks. The Argentine Junta, which had murdered around 30,000 of its own people, fell, and the Falkland Islands, by the way, there are around 400 of them, remain British. Now I'm going to point out on some slides some important locations. These are the Falkland Islands here. So around 400 islands stretching over a period of 1,000 miles. The ones that you want to focus on are these here, closest to Argentina. There's two islands there, one's called East Falkland, and the other one, surprisingly enough, is called West Falkland. So that's point one to remember. Point two is South Georgia here. Right, the next point to remember, and there's really only three, because I'm assuming you know where the United Kingdom is, and that's Ascension Island here in the equatorial area of the South Atlantic. So an outline is 4,000 miles from here to here, roughly, and another 4,000 miles down to here. Let me take you back 35 years ago to 1982 in order to set the social and political context. The British people then, like now, were going through a crisis of identity and tough economic times. Difficult decisions were being made not least about defense. These are the leaders of the two countries at the time. So you've got Margaret Thatcher, who you all know, and then you've got, this is Leopoldo Galtieri. He was sort of head of the junta. And then his number two was Admiral Anya here. He was head of the Argentine Navy and had a sort of political and military history. And then here we have Secretary of State for Defense, my dear friend, John Knott. John Knott, the Secretary of State for Defense, had decided to get rid of our most flexible of forces, the amphibious fleet, the Royal Marines, and Parachute Regiment, in favor of nuclear missile submarines. Knott just did not believe in anything other than the Central Front and deterrence. On March the 27th, two Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships and fleet tankers, Apple Leaf and Replenishment Ship Fort Austin, were given orders to head to the South Atlantic. Now, one of the other things that's gonna come out in this presentation is logistics. Actually supplying ships at sea and a fleet at sea, and then supplying troops on the land over this distance. The East, in order to sustain a fleet, you have to have the ability for that fleet to refuel. You have to have the ability for that fleet to be replenished. And so these ships are some of the most important ships in the Navy. On March the 28th, the Argentine invasion force sailed from Argentina. And on March the 29th, Prime Minister Thatcher openly deployed nuclear submarines south as a show of force in an attempt to halt the invasion. On March the 31st, Thatcher authorized planning for deployment of forces. And on April the 2nd, Argentine Marines landed and captured Stanley on East Falkland and then South Georgia. The domestically unpopular Argentine military junta had succeeded in its aim. The Argentine population was thrilled. For the British nation, after many years of perceived humiliation and decline, this was the last straw. The public rallied behind Thatcher's call to launch a task force ships were rapidly taken up from trade. Here's the cruise ship Canberra, the first of 54 ships taken up from trade. They were called stuffed ships. They were converted with helicopter platforms and loaded with stores within days. Many of these stores were never seen again. This was the ship on which I returned after the conflict. In a matter of days, thanks to outstanding work from civilian workforce, some of whom were still working on the ships as they sailed, converting them to be able to refuel at sea and accommodate many hundreds of troops. It was an extraordinary achievement just to get these ships to sail within 72 hours. Now I think it's time to talk about the Commander Brigade Royal Marines. 
This commando brigade consists of three Royal Marine commandos. These are essentially infantry battalions, but they're called commandos by the Royal Marines. They have a commando artillery regiment in support, and they're staffed by artillery army commandos who have all gone through the same training as the Royal Marines. They have a brigade air squadron with their own helicopters, a brigade signal squadron for communication. The naval air squadron here is Royal Navy, those are the support helicopters. The SBS, which is like, it's like uh, your SEALs, except they don't write as many books. <laughs> and the general feeling was that if we deployed and, and just went into a poised position, which US Marines understand, then politicians would have time to sort this out. Both Julian Thompson and myself completely disagreed with that analysis. If you look at the personality of Galtieri, who staked the entire future of his junta and government on retaining the Falklands, and then you look at the personality of Margaret Thatcher, who has staked the entire future and credibility of her government on getting them back, there really wasn't any room at all for compromise. We were faced with an enemy force that was around 10,000 strong and plenty of time to prepare defensive positions. The strength of our reinforced brigade with two parachute battalions was 5,000. We would also be outgunned. For example, they had 155 millimeter guns, we had 105. And we were going to lack air superiority despite what we were being told. Even reaching the islands without being blown out of the water by the Argentine Air Force and Navy was a question. Initially, our intelligence information was limited to what we had seen on the BBC and what our intelligence section could grab from the Plymouth Library, James Fighting Ships of the World, military balance and donated slides, photos and assumptions based on Argentina's close ties with the US military. Luckily, we had a Royal Marine officer on board HMS Fearless, Ewan Sotheby Taylor, who you've now seen, who spent a year on the islands and as an ocean sailor had mapped and taken sounds of every cove. His information was invaluable in deciding where we should land. The Falkland Islands is a brutally cold, windy, and snowy place, and we were heading into an Antarctic winter war, a similar type of environment to winter in northern Norway, where we were trained and ready to fight. We decided that the capital Stanley was the vital ground, West Falkland, East Falkland. And this is where we chose to land, here, San Carlos. If we took Stanley, the rest of the Argentine position would collapse. We didn't have the firepower or capability to carry out an assault on Stanley, but if we could get ashore in a lightly defended location, perhaps we could leverage our ability to fight in really cold climates in an Antarctic winter and fight our way through the mountains to Stanley. This whole area is mountainous through here, and that's where we were gonna go. The US residents could not have been more helpful. The Pan Am manager responsible for running Wide Awake Airfield said to Brigadier Julian Thompson, my president says you can have anything you want. He meant the president of Pan Am, not the president of the US, but it was, <laughs> but it was obvious that direction was coming from higher up, indeed from the very top, and was not restricted to what Wide Awake could provide. We were due to meet up on HMS Hermes, which was Woodward's flagship, to hammer out what plan we were going to employ. For me, April the 17th, which I refer to as the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, was the most stressful day of the campaign. I've emailed my old commander, Julian Thompson, about this recently, and he confirms he felt the same. Between Fieldhouse, Woodward, and their staff, there was little to no knowledge of the most difficult of war fighting pastimes, which is amphibious operations. Every headquarters was presenting their own plans, some bordering on delusional, not least around requiring me to build an airfield for F-4 Phantom II jet interceptor fighter bombers on West Falkland, even closer to Argentina as well as not understanding the huge size, scale, and time of building an airfield for fast jets, 
There was no understanding of vital ground. The battle is about Stanley, nothing else. Or amphibious and battlefield logistics, which limited how long we could fight. The naive assumption on the part of some that we would have air superiority was frankly breathtaking. Our plan was approved. We had already started to put it into action with a logistic restow between ships, and now it was official. Anyone who thought there was going to be a diplomatic solution and we were not going to fight had to rethink when on May the 2nd, the cruiser General Balgrano was sunk by the Royal Navy's hunter-killer nuclear submarine, HMS Conqueror. Two days later, our HMS Sheffield, the Type 42 guided missile destroyer, was hit by one of two AM-39 Exocet missiles fired from two Argentine super intard aircraft. When she sank, HMS Sheffield became the first Royal Naval ship lost in action since the end of World War II. She would not be the last. The Royal Navy and Merchant Navy had shown extraordinary feats of seamanship in mountainous seas and ability to fight against the Argentine Navy and Air Force. In the ground war, the leadership of Julian Thompson and the toughness of the Royal Marine Commandos and paratroopers won the day. We freed British subjects in the Falkland Islands from an alien occupation. Moreover, we liberated the Argentine population on the mainland from a brutal military dictatorship. However, we don't get much credit from that from the Argentine. But most of all, we brought pride and a sense of vision and possibility back to our nation. It changed the way the British felt about themselves. From the day I first went to the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, I carried around a quote from Field Marshal Slim in my wallet. I've lost it now, but here's the spirit of that quote. No country can bestow any greater honor on any man or woman than he or she be called to lead their fellow countrymen in battle. I can say with absolute certainty I have been given no greater honor in my long life than that. Thus it was then, and thus it is now. Thank you. <laughs>